Good morning. It's uh, nice to be with you this morning as we uh, continue uh, to finish up our little talks on virtue. And uh, just want to uh, let you know there's a few uh, high schools that uh, are not with us this morning for other reasons. Uh, York Catholic is on retreat, so we didn't want to disrupt their retreat, so we will not be seeing them this morning. And also... Uh, uh, the Jesuit Mass this afternoon and... Uh, Trinity. Trinity is a Tenebrae service. Has a Tenebrae service, so we're not here. But here uh, with us, we have uh, the students from McDevitt here at the, the Dawson Center, so we're happy to have them with us and also with you. And uh, so we'll begin this morning, as we do every time, we'll begin with a prayer and the same type of thing. I'll do a little scripture reading, and then we'll move on to the uh, topic for this morning. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. This reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus. As for yourselves, you must say what is consistent with sound doctrine, namely that older men should be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and endurance. Similarly, older women should be reverent in her behavior, not slanders, not addicted to drink, teaching what is good, so that they may train younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, chaste, good homemakers, under control of their husbands, so that the word of God may not be discredited. Urge the younger men similarly to control themselves, showing yourself as a model of good deeds in every respect, with integrity in your teaching, dignity and sound speech that cannot be criticized, so that the opponent will be put to shame without anything bad to say about us. For the grace of God has appeared, saving all and training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires and to live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to deliver us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people as his own, eager to do what is good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I chose the uh, reading from Titus this morning because it really talks about the idea of God having a plan for each one of us. Uh, In this particular uh, episode that we chose to read from, St. Paul is talking to Titus, who, like Paul, is a bishop. And uh, he was appointed as the overseer of the Christians in Crete. The purpose of Paul writing to Titus is to help Titus in his work of teaching Christian behavior. We hear in the passage that he addresses first older men, then older women, as well as young men, to live a life worthy of their Christian dignity and their Christian call. And that's so important for all of us, to understand that we are called to live as disciples of the Lord Jesus, to live out our Christian vocation in the world. And this was essentially important at the beginning of the church. That's why St. Paul is, you know, so adamant in suggesting to Titus, you know, in terms of helping people to grow in their relationship with the Lord, that the encouragement be to actually live the Christian life, to live the Christian virtues. Uh, It's important for us to understand, for all of us to understand, our faith is not simply about going to church on Sunday. Our faith is living a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that's in concert with the way God intended human beings to live as his sons and daughters. It's important for us to understand that this lifestyle has certain characteristics and aspects to it. And Paul was encouraging Titus to encourage the disciples to be attention to that. And he uses words such as uh, temperate, such as justice, such as love. These are the things that should be the hallmark of a Christian life. As we reflect on the last cardinal virtue today, which is temperance, you know, we see that it means more than just avoiding the sins of gluttony and overindulgence. Again, in the last couple of talks, we've been looking at the cardinal virtues, and we've already covered the cardinal virtues of justice, of fortitude, and prudence. And today, we want to look at the idea of temperance. And the reason for that is because temperance really is the idea of right living. And temperance actually monitors and directs our relationship to things in this world and to one another. 
it, it really means living in a balance. It means living our life in a balance of attention, attention of knowing that this world is passing, and attention of knowing that we are destined for the eternal kingdom of God. And so we almost are living with a foot in two worlds, uh, on the wor world which is coming about in, in the kingdom of God, and also at the same time in the world that we know, as Jesus tells us, this world is passing. And so let's talk about temperance. The Catechism gives us this broad definition of the virtue of temperance. Temperance is the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. It ensures that the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within the limits of what is honorable. I think it's important to focus. We're talking about the will. We're talking about our ability to make decisions. We're talking about the idea of being masters of our life and the idea of recognizing that we don't live instinctually. We have an intellect and we have a free will and we have make choices. And so temperance is very much focused on that idea of the idea of the will. You know, how do we choose? Uh, how do we choose what is good? How do we choose what is right? The definition helps us to, uh, to see our need to maintain some control, especially over how we use the goods of this world. Now, I want to emphasize to you that the world is good. And I mean, and that's important for us to understand as Catholics. We're not people who are negative on the world. As a matter of fact, we're people who are positive on the world. Why is that? Because God created the world. And we know from the scripture, in creating the world, he's, he made the world good. And so we see the world as good. But we also understand that there is a design to the world. There is a way that God has put the world together in which he intended it to be used and, tend to be, and for us to live in it. And so when we talk about the virtue of temperance, we're really looking about the idea of recognizing from the very beginning, we're people who affirm the goodness of life and affirm the goodness of the world. But we also are people that have to realize that we have to make sure that we use the, the things of the world in a way that the Lord intended that. So if temperance means moderating our attraction to good created things, then also we need to ask ourselves a question. Can we have too much of a good thing? You know, if it's, this is good, is there such a thing as having too much of something that is good? This is one of the most ancient questions. In fact, in the ancient world, thousands of years even before Jesus Christ and Christianity, Greek philosophers used to ask themselves this very same question. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? The earliest answers come from the culture of Crete in Greece, where not coincidentally, at this time, Paul was addressing Titus, who was heading there to be the bishop at that time. The Cretans had the mythical story of Icarus, who flew too, too close to the sun with wax wings. Icarus's wings melted, and he fell to his doom because he could not fly the middle course. Now, again, it's a myth, but it talks about the idea that the sun is good, the warmth is good, but sometimes too much of it is not good. We know that ourselves. You know, today, modern science tells us that, yeah, the sun is good, you know, it's helpful, but if we get down to the seashore and we just sit out in the sun for long periods of time, uh, we've had the experience that sun can sometimes be not good, right? Uh, when I was younger, luckily you, you are much younger than myself, uh, but we didn't know all this about science, but when we used to go to the seashore of my family, you know, uh, we only got to go for a week. And when we went down there, the first day uh, when we went onto the beach, we all looked like ghosts because we were completely white, <laughs> right? But we were so happy to be at the seashore and spend the day in the, in the surf that we spent the whole day on the seashore. Unfortunately, that night, you know, our bodies were toasted. <laughs> and often, sometimes, we even blistered, you know, because of the intensity of the heat. Now, of course, today we use sunscreen. But even there, we find out that uh, even some sunscreen is not sufficient. You know, that actually, you need more and more. So the sun is good. So the reason why I tell you that, that's it's interesting. The Greeks knew that many years before you know, in this idea of Icarus, okay? Other Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle would adapt this thought 
uh, when they talked about the idea of the golden mean. Aristotle and Plato are, are famous philosophers, and they talked about you know, uh, how to live well. And they talked about the idea of a mean. There's something as a golden mean. And the golden mean teaches that we should avoid extremes at either end of the spectrum, uh, that somehow that the truth is in the middle, and that we try to always constantly look at that, so we avoid extremes. For instance, you know, too much food can make us overweight and unhealthy, and that's one extreme. But there's another extreme. Too little food can make us malnourished and unhealthy. You know, we know today some people suffer from trying to figure out, you know, how much food to eat. As a matter of fact, we know that some young people uh, suffer because they want to have the perfect weight, they want to be, look perfect, and consequently sometimes they get into a, a sickness, you know, because they are going to try to not eat too much, or sometimes go the other way. And so the idea of the golden mean is to understand that, you know, food is good, you know, and good food is good, a good thing, but too much of a good thing is not good for our bodies, and so we must be conscious of that. Now, what does all this have to do with the virtue of temperance? You know, well, a great deal. St. Thomas said that moral virtues are consistent with following the mean. So, you know, Thomas Aquinas would say that follow the mean. Uh, try to stay in the middle course. Uh, try not to overindulge in something that is good, but the other, uh, other side, don't indulge in something that is, uh, is evil. And in our spiritual tradition, following the great Greek thinkers and reflecting on the scriptures, St. Benedict writes in his rule for monks, he uses the word moderation in all things. Eating, drinking, sleeping, working. His goal was to teach his monks to be balanced in their life. In a sense, too much of a good thing is not always a good thing, just as too little of a good thing is a deficit for us. And especially now, as you are moving out into uh, you know, the next phase of your life, especially going on to college, uh, I'd like to go back to St. Benedict's there about the idea of moderation in all things. Uh, now, he mentions some things here that's important. Obviously, eating and drinking, right? He also mentions the idea of sleeping and work. You know, it's important, as science tells us, that we have a balanced life. You know, and you're going to find out that sometimes when you go to college, you know, that one of the things you're going to sometimes skip is sleep, either because on the weekends everybody's out partying, right, or, you know, you're up uh, studying until all hours of the night, and so you're not going to sleep uh, because you think that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. You know, the moderation is to make sure that you look to see if you get seven or eight hours of sleep each night. You know, and that's just something that's reasonable. You know, and I guarantee you, if you do that, you're not going to miss the parties because you'll have some time at that. And you're not going to miss, you know, being uh, academically good. As a matter of fact, by depriving yourself of street sleep and cramming for studies, you're going to forget most of what you tried to do anyway. So balance it out throughout the year. So I think that's important. Let's talk about the idea of too much of a good thing and too bad of a good thing. And I'm going to talk to something today uh, that's very close to all of you right now, I think. Because, uh, and again, when I say this, I, I, uh, I say it, understanding that you're starting to look at the end of your days at high school and some of the traditions that go with that, okay? So I'm going to talk about the idea of too much of a good thing or the idea of maybe perhaps things not being in moderation. And I'm going to use something that's very clear to you right now. I'm going to talk about the senior prom, okay? Now, they're going to say, what? well, I know that many of you, you know, men and women, lady, young men and young ladies, has spent hours getting ready for this, or you're going to spend hours. You know, for the young ladies, you, you're looking for that perfect dress, you know. And some of you may have spent quite a lot of money already for that day. You're looking towards this day, okay. Now, I have to ask the question, is it possible that there's too much of a good thing? Okay, and what do I mean by that? Well, the prom is a great event. It's a, objectively a good thing. But sometimes... We're immoderate, or I say, or intemperate with our approach to the prom. Senior prom is really about being together. It's about celebrating the end of the year and the end of high school. It's about enjoying friends 
and celebrating friendship. You know, in some ways, it, we become so focused on the things that surround it that we forget about this is the essential thing. The opportunity of being together, the idea of enjoying each other's company, uh, the idea of getting to the moment when you're celebrating and you're coming to the end where you'll be, you'll be separating and parting and so you want to just enjoy each other's company. Okay? That's in a sense what a prom is supposed to be. Uh, when the virtue of temperance guides us regarding proms, we find ourselves making decisions that should be based on what's important and avoiding the extremes that get, sometimes can get us in trouble. For example, for the girls, do I need to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on a dress that I might only wear one time? You know, why not find a dress that's reasonably priced okay, that you might be able to wear again? This is not your wedding day. We're not looking for a wedding gown. Okay? We're not looking for a day that's irrepeatable. It's, it's not a life altering. It is a, a nice day, but it's not changing your life. Okay? So I think there's a moderation. And we have to work with each other on this because a lot of times uh, we live in a world of, uh, you know, we put pressure on ourselves. You know, we don't want to look like we're the odd person out. You know? And so, and unfortunately, we live in a society where, you know, uh, the marketing experts uh, give us the impression we need these things. Uh, we live in a, 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 you know, a public relations age, you know, and so people who are merchandisers, they're going to say, you can't live without this dress. You know, life is not going to go on tomorrow unless you look this way. Well, I beg to differ, so we got to look at that, okay? Another thing, you know, a lot of us spend money, we're going to rent a big limousine, right? We're going to get a, a, a huge SUV, right, for the occasion, right? We're going to spend thousand dollars to get our, our ride, you know. Uh, I don't know. The question is, what, what is the purpose of the ride? Is it to get us from one place to the other? Okay. Uh, moderation. For, for many of us, you know, our families, we live in difficult times. You know, for many of our parents, some have lost their job. You know, some are struggling just to, you know, pay the mortgage. You know, uh, and in a sense, you know, now you're getting to an age, hopefully, where you're sensitive to the struggles that your parents have had to put you through school, uh, the struggles your parents have had to raise you, you know, and, uh, you know, is it right for them to continue to struggle, you know, because they do want to help you to make you happy? Is it proper to put them into an expense that's very difficult? They want to do it because they love you, but is it fair to do that? You know, so, uh, you know, I just suggest these are things. I'm not saying these are bad things, but I'm just saying these things you should look at. And let's not again also forget how we dance and how we treat our dates. You know, and I find this, uh, having been a president of a high school, you know, uh, I think this is really something that uh, I would just speak to you very uh, candidly about. You know, most of you are in the process of, uh, you know, getting dates for the prom, okay? Uh, this is always a... Uh, challenging time, especially for guys, you know, because they're always afraid that the girls might turn them down, right? It's also a challenging time for the girls because they don't want to be embarrassed or left out, right? And now how do I know that? Well, I'll tell you a little story. When I was a senior like yourselves, you know, it was always very daunting. Uh, you know, I was a basketball player and stuff like that, but I, you know, in terms of asking somebody for the prom, you're always afraid that, you know, you don't want to get a no, no answer, you know? So you always put it off to the last minute. As a matter of fact, uh, somebody at Lancaster Catholic asked me if I, today I could ask their, a girl to date, to date for them. I won't say who that is, but, but in a sense. Uh, but I can't do that on television here, or I would. You know, <laughs> It would not be appropriate for me to ask uh, one of the guys asking one of the girls for a date in Lancaster Catholic. But I'm sure that every girl at Lancaster Catholic would be thrilled to go with the guy who's asking. So uh, anyway. Uh, when I was a senior, I, you know, I went to the senior prom, but in the spring, there was a spring formal uh, for the girls' school. And uh, what happened is, uh, you know, I really wasn't interested in going, you know, because I had already gone to, we had a senior prom early in the year. Unlike uh, you, we had a senior prom early in the year. Uh, but they decided to have the spring formal. You know, so one Friday afternoon, and, and the spring formal was that night, a Friday night. So as I'm sitting in the classroom at seventh period, you know, uh, a student comes to the door from the principal's office with a little note 
the principal wants to see me. Okay. So I said, okay. So I went down to the principal's office and I walk in and it was Father Grass and sitting in the room was three girls from West Catholic down the street who are a friend of the girls who I took to the prom, you know. And uh, Father Grass said, the girls have something to ask you. And they said, well, Marie is disappointed she's not going to the spring forward tonight. We wonder, would you take her? <laughs> so it was sort of awkward. So I, <laughs> so anyway, I went to the spring formal. Uh, had to run home. I couldn't get a tux, so we got what we did, and we got to the spring formal. But so in a sense, I know what it's, sometimes is daunting this whole thing. But what I say is, uh, you know, uh, that's that's part of experience. But in most times, you know, uh, we have to be courageous. The other thing I, I say about the idea of relationship, we take people to a prom. If you ask somebody to come to a prom with them, I think it's very important that you respect people with dignity. You know, uh, I've had the experience of seeing people take somebody to the prom and then they put them over in a corner and don't pay, don't pay attention to them because really they were just asked somebody to get there just because they wanted to be with the rest of their friends and they're not paying attention to the persons there. You know, I say this because I, I think it's important to be sensitive. You know, if you ask somebody to accompany you to a prom, I think it's important for you really to make sure that you are with them. And that's on both sides, the guys and the girls. You know, guys, you don't have the right just to sort of move away from the date you brought. And the same thing to girls. You know, maybe your friends are over in the corner here. You have to understand that you've come together and to enjoy it. And, and some of the things I just asked you to watch is, is in terms of, you know, dancing is a good thing. I'm concerned about us understanding, though, there's an appropriate way as we as Catholics will understand dance, okay? And the way that we dance is, is an important thing. There, there is much what I would say in today's society that can be very troubling. You know, uh, we know that of concupiscence. We know basically that we are, you know, uh, people that, you know, can sometimes be easily aroused, et cetera. And uh, I would just say moderation in the way you approach dance is important in our society. Always respecting the individual. Always respecting our human sexuality. That is so important. That's part of the virtue of temperance, respecting uh, our, each individual, respecting our human bodies, respecting who we are. And so we do not want to do any type of dance that would demean or take away the beauty of a person or our human sexuality, what life is. Okay. One other thing which I talk about proms is the idea of, since all of you are, are underage, you're not supposed to be drinking. <laughs> now, I know that... Uh, I've had the experience, and I just want to say this. First of all, it shouldn't be, okay? But so often, you know, uh, I've been at proms as, a, as a, both a high school teacher and as a president where somebody unfortunately comes in, and, you know, shortly into the prom, uh, they have to go to the bathroom because they're sick, you know, and they're, all of a sudden they're throwing up, and we find out that basically, you know, this person uh, decided to, that the night couldn't be a complete without, you know, uh, enjoying some liquor. You know, I've had the experience where, you know, you go in and it's usually somebody who probably has never drank before in their life and their friends perhaps may have, which is not a good thing, but then they encourage them. But then all of a sudden the person winds up and one instance I had somebody who, uh, within a matter of a half hour on the way to the prom, uh, drank a half a bottle of vodka, you know. Now, unfortunately, not only did he get sick, but we had to take him to the hospital because they were almost uh, dying from an uh, alcohol uh, problem. So I just say that because the virtue of temperance is, is important, you know, that first of all, you, you should not be involved with the alcohol, but if the other thing is the idea of, uh, you know, moderation in all things, uh, this is part of our aspect of our living as you go forward. Okay. Uh, also, how you celebrate the post-prom. Uh, again, it's a prom, okay? Uh, for many of you, you know, since we like to ex keep the thing going, right? And sometimes we, that can be overboard too, right? Because the prom ends at midnight, so we have to go for another party until six o'clock in the morning. And that party's over and we have to have another day, so we're gonna go to the mountains or we're gonna go to the seashore for some more time, okay? I just want to talk about the idea of moderation. You know, uh, there's moderation in terms of what you do. Uh, 
too much of a good thing sometimes can become a bad thing. You know, and unfortunately, we've had the experience that too much of a good thing becomes a bad experience you know, for people. And so I would just suggest to be careful in terms of what you are doing to understand and keep it in focus. Right? What I'm really talking about really is that all things are about exercising control over ourselves and over our choices. The virtue of temperance frees us up to make good choices and appropriate choices. It's a freedom that is born from self-control. Temperance helps to direct our use of our passing things in this world, the good created things, and even the good pleasures of the world in an appropriate and moderate sense. You know, for the sense of respecting ourselves, respect in terms of living life as the word asks us to do that. Let's go from a practical example now to an example of somebody who did this. You know, uh, now you know that last couple times I pointed out maybe a saint that tried to live this virtue. So today I want to talk about uh, a blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. And I hold him up because uh, Pope uh, John Paul II, now blessed John Paul II, uh, held uh, blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati up as an example for young people of somebody who managed to live a very good life. And he's a blessed, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he was, he's a saint who died in 1925 at the age of 24. He died because of illness. Yet this is the reason he's a saint. He's a saint because despite the environment in which he was raised, Pier Giorgio heard and responded generously to the call of God in his life. Pier Giorgio grew up in a well-to-do family. His father was a very prominent figure who owned a newspaper called La Stampa. From an early age, Pier Giorgio had everything he could ever want in life. He was handsome, he was talented, he was friendly, he had a personality that attracted other people to him. Despite having so much, the Frasades were not a very religious family. They did not regularly practice their faith. You know, his parents had a lot of money, were very successful, but they didn't practice their faith. Uh, early on, interesting enough, however, Pierre Giorgio felt a call to practice his faith in spite of what he had grown up with. He didn't use his parents as an excuse to avoid doing what he knew instinctively was right. He felt that he should somehow be practicing his faith. So, interesting on, as an adolescent, Pierre Giorgio used to arrange to have one of the workers at his parents' home wake him up in the middle of the night so that he could make a trip to the nearest church for Mass. He attended Mass every day in this manner without his parents ever knowing it. He had many friends, and oftentimes, when deciding how to spend their free time, Pierre Giorgio would convince them to come with him to church first. There, he would spend time praying at the altar while his friends sometimes would fall asleep in the back of the church in the pews. Oftentimes, however, he would refuse to go on trips with them if he knew that he would not have the opportunity to go to Mass. He made sacrifices so that his friends realized that they had to give in to his demands, otherwise they wouldn't see him. Uh, he lived his life. He wanted to have his friends, but he had priority. Uh, this is the way he wanted to live his life. So he didn't li live his life based upon his friends. He lived his life based upon how he wanted his life to be lived. And so a very important part of that was his relationship with the Lord. Uh, for Pierre Giorgio, the gift of his friends was important. And the simple fact that they put up with his demands, they used to go to church with him, they used to follow him, showed that he was a good friend to them in return. However, he would never let anyone or anything compromise what was the most important relationship in his life, which was God. He loved God first with his whole heart. This was the secret of how he appropriately loved others and the things of this world. You see, one of the ironies in life is, if we're in good relationship with God, we will be in good relationship with others. Often, if we're not in good relationship with God, we won't be in good relationship with others. Really, that's the thing that uh, the Lord teaches us. And you may say, well, Bishop, where do you get that idea? Well, very f uh, easily, if you look at the scriptures and start in the uh, book of Genesis, in the beginning, we're told in the book of Genesis that there was chaos in the world. But then we're told that the Holy Spirit came upon the world and all of a sudden brought order to it. You know, 
And that is a dynamic for us to understand. If we're in right relationship with God, then I guarantee you all of our other relationships will be in, rela in proper relationship. God has the ability to bring order to our life and order to all things. And that's something that, you know, Pierre Giorgio understood, that having a right relationship with God would be influenced basically his relationship with others. And so therefore he'd be able to have good relationship with others because he knew what it meant to be a good friend. He knew what it meant to respect others. Uh, taught to him by his relationship with the Lord. When he had money, often rather than spending it on himself, he would reach out to those who were in need. He used to buy food for the hungry peasants in his area, and he bought medicines for the sick. He did this all without the guidance or help of his parents. He just saw this and he felt this was right, that he had so much that he should help others. As a young man, he made choices to do this. Uh, when he would see somebody who was sick, when you'd see somebody who needed something, he went out to help them. On his deathbed, his sister tells the story that Pierre Giorgio asked for some paper and pen. He scribbled out a note. In spite of not being able to write so well because of his illness, the note was to a friend and was asking his friend to get some medicine for a sick man that he knew lived nearby. Pierre Giorgio, as he lay dying, performed a self act of charity by sending his friend to a pharmacy to buy medicine for somebody else that he felt was in need. When Pierre Giorgio died, thousands of people showed up at his funeral. Thousands of people. Remember, he was 24 years old. But they were not the wealthy and they were not the aristocrats for which his family was familiar. He's, the, the mourners were the poor, the sick, the marginalized, and the lowly from all over Turin. They all knew P Pierre Giorgio. They all knew him as a friend. I would say that Pierre Giorgio saw all the pleasures and good things of this world in their proper sense. He saw that everything good reflected God, whom he loved above all things. Although in a position to forget about God and virtue completely, Pierre Giorgio chose God for his short life on earth. The Catechism of the Catholic quotes St. Augustine with words that I think apply very well to blessed Pierre Giorgio and can inspire each of us. And it's simply this, to live well is nothing other than to love God with all one's heart, with all one's soul, and with all one's efforts. From this it comes about that love is kept whole and uncorrupted through temperance. No misfortune can disturb it, and this is fortitude. It obeys only God, and this is justice, and is careful in discerning things, so as not to be surprised by deceit or trickery, and this is prudence. As we see in this little quote, you know, we cover those four cardinal virtues that I've been talking to you about uh, during the last couple of weeks. Uh, today we come to the end of our little discussion about virtue, and I just want you to understand that you know, the reason why we talk to you about this is because, you know, you're taking control of your life as you go forward. As I've said many times, hopefully in the last couple of weeks, you know, we are concerned about you, that you have a good life, that you live a full life. Uh, we believe very strongly that our Catholic faith helps us to experience the fullness of joy and happiness in this life, but most importantly also pre pre prepares us for the fullness of joy in eternity. You know, and if we live our life in integrity, as God calls us to do that, I guarantee you that we'll have a very good life. We'll have a life that, you know, gives us great satisfaction. It will not always be a life that gives us full happiness. And I'd like to just uh, finish by making a little distinction here between happiness and joy. I'm going to talk to you about an event that happened to me yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon here at the Dyson Center, we had a uh, soup and salad and a sermon for Catholic charities raising money for the Catholic charities in the diocese. And the focus of the soup and salad yesterday was the idea of adoption services. It was the services that are provided by the Diocese of Harrisburg, the Catholic charities, for helping people to adopt children. And we had three different couples who were here who had adopted children through the Catholic Charities Agency here in the diocese. One was uh, an international adoption. And what that was was the child was adopted from the 
Marshall Islands. And it was told how Catholic Charities helped the couple to be able to negotiate uh, the various uh, laws to be able to get the child to be adopted here. And uh, it was very fulfilling. The second uh, couple was a couple who were uh, looked for what they called domestic adoption. Okay, and the diocese helped them to find a child you know, that was being put up for adoption and helped them to be able to uh, be put together. And they were very pleased with the young boy that they have is now two years old. The third uh, adoption was by a couple who adopted a child with special needs. And it was very interesting to hear this. Uh, and the way they got into adoption was that they had one biological daughter, but on their second effort at a child, unfortunately it was a miscarriage and the child was lost. But also apparently that prevented them from being able to conceive a biological child themselves. They were very distressed and very distraught about this. And for a year they were very sad. But at the end of the year, all of a sudden, they were very close to the Lord and they had the feeling that God was asking something else of them. And all of a sudden came into the picture, they were called to ask if they could take care of a special needs child who had a tracheotomy, you know, whose foster mother had, come to, uh, had uh, cancer and was no longer able to take care of this child. And so it was a neighbor. And so they agreed to take care of this child with this, had many issues, tracheotomy, et cetera, and took the child in. They grew to love the child. And then they realized their call might be to be able to look to, to help other children who might be special needs children. And so they went off on that tangent. But the gentleman said something very interesting. He said that they were moved to do this because Jesus was telling them to do that. And he said the interesting thing was that in adopting the special needs children, that they found great joy in their life. And he said, now he said, that doesn't mean that we're always happy. And he said, he said, there's a difference between happiness and joy. He said, there are days we're happy, but there are days not. But he said, we're always filled with joy. There's a deep sense of joy in what we do. And I just point that out to you because you see, in living the virtuous life, there's gonna be crosses. There's gonna be challenges. But what the Lord guarantees us, that if we live in integrity of life, that there would be a joy about us that only God can give to us. And that really is the fulfillment of a good life. And that's really what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to be joyful. Uh, many things can make us happy, but that's not really what the Lord's giving to us. The Lord's giving us a sense of joy, joy in knowing who we are, joy in knowing that we're loved, and joy in terms of being God's people. You know, and so today, you know, uh, my hope for you as you go forward, uh, I'm very happy to have been able to talk to you for the last couple of weeks. You know, I know sometimes it's tough just to sit there and listen to somebody talk for 40 minutes, you know, so I appreciate your patience with me, you know, but I want you to know that I do want you to have a beautiful future, you know, and as you go forward, I promise I will pray for you, you know, that you will embrace the gospel to realize what, what you have been learned over the years is not something that is a weight around your neck, but really, in many ways, is a flotation collar to help keep you up, you know, in a sea that can often overwhelm you, you know, and hold on to your faith. Uh, it is an anchor. It'll keep you rooted. And if you live out your faith, I guarantee you that at the end of your life, you'll be able to say, you know, I had more than I could ever hope or imagine. Why? Because you're working in concert with God, who is the source of all joy, the source of all happiness. And so with that, you know, I will we'll put the opportunity for questions up. I do want to answer one question, though, that came into me by email. And uh, I'll explain it to you because it's a, it's a difficult question. And I won't identify the school that it came from, but it's a question, and it revolves around the proms. And it's a hard question. Uh, this is the question. For many of you in the various high schools, one of the issues that often comes up at this time of year, every year, is the idea of paying tuition. As you know, unfortunately, because we don't have school choice in this country, your parents have to pay uh, to get you an education. Okay? And the only way that we can run our schools really is by the tuition that your parents pay. I mean, that's what we use to pay our teachers, et cetera. Uh, 
Unfortunately, we get in situations where sometimes uh, uh, parents, for whatever reason, you know, are not able to pay the tuition or fall behind. Okay. And so that's a problem. Uh, that's an issue. And sometimes uh, we have to go to great lengths to try to collect that tuition. Okay. And so sometimes schools put together policies to try to be able to get the money in. You know, it's not something that the schools like to do. It's not something that their boards like to do. But they have to, at least, they have responsibility to, to run the school and to get the resources they need. So one of the questions is this. In some schools, and maybe your school, they have a policy that if your tuition's not paid up, you can't buy a prom ticket. You know, now that can be very hurtful for you, you know, uh, and that can be a very hurtful situation. And the question that came from the student is, is this fair to the, to the boy or girl who's in this position? That they can't go to a prom because of this payment. And, you know, don't you think that's not right? You know, that this is not, when we talk about forgiveness and helping, is this right? Okay. Uh, I would suggest this is a very hard situation to be able to answer the question. Because I've been in that position as president of a high school for eight years. One of the most difficult times uh, for me as president used to always be prom time. Because you had the situation where we had a number of students whose tuition was not paid up. And we had to get the tuition. Uh, the problem so often was that it wasn't that uh, we hadn't tried to get the tuition. Okay? By sending letters home to the families, by encouraging them, stuff like that. Even inviting parents to come in to talk to us to see if we could see what we could do to help them. Uh, unfortunately, even sometimes our best efforts, there was people who just ignored us. And so consequently, sometimes the only thing we could do is sort of say, well, here, we have to uh, you know, establish this policy. Uh, one of the things that is, uh, is uh, difficult is uh, the this, this stress that we put on proms. You know, and often we sort of say, well, somehow somebody's high school experience is incomplete unless they go to the prom. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, bust the, the balloon here, but believe me, life continues if you don't go to the prom. Believe me, it does. Uh, but uh, sometimes we have to be realistic about what we can and can't do. You know, and in one of the letters that the student wrote, you know, sometimes it can be embarrassing for a student to have to tell their friends that the reason why they can't go is because you know, the tuition's not paid or they can't afford it. You know, I want you to understand something. There's no shame in being poor. There's no shame in saying that, you know, I can't do something because, you know, our family can't afford it. You know, the idea of the priorities, I guess, for the issue of, there is an issue of mercy, but there's also an issue of justice. You know, and so, so often in these decisions, it's a ma matter of balancing the scale. You know, the justice of knowing that our teachers need to be paid. The justice of knowing that the school can't be run without the resources we need. Okay, so therefore, we have a responsibility for our teachers to be able to get the resources in necessary to pay them their salary, right? The other scale is, well, how about concern for the student? Well, there is concern for the student, but again, it's a matter of what are the values? What is the most important thing? The school is there, yes, there's extracurricular activities, but the important thing is an education, you know? And uh, so that really is what the school is about. It's about the educational mis mission, helping to be educated. Uh, the auxiliary things of having extracurricular activities of proms and stuff like that, it's nice. But in some ways, we can't afford all things, you know. And so there is a balance here. So the question was, where do I fall on this? Well, I would like the parents of that particular student maybe to go to talk to the administrators to see what they can do, you know. If it is tr truly a hardship situation where the tuition is something difficult for the parents to do, you know, I have no problem if you want to write to me, you know, your parents write to me and see what we can do in terms of that, helping them out with that tuition. You know, now I can't do it for every, can't do things for everybody. But also, there has to be that balance in terms of uh, justice. So, you know, I do ask that, you know, uh, it's not a policy that is oppressive. It's not something that we like to do. But it comes from uh, experience. You know, experience of perhaps, and it's hard to believe that some people are not always honest, even honest in terms of with the families. You know, uh, they're not honest. For example, I'll give you one last example. You know, one time I was dealing with a family, you know, they had three children in the school, 
and they were way behind on their tuition payments, you know. And so uh, the policy was that the students couldn't come back to the high school the next year unless they had fulfilled their, all their obligations for last year. Okay, so uh, this man called me in, in, in the end of July and wanted to come in and talk to me because he still had, uh, you know, about the $5,000 he owed me from the year before. And he wanted the students to get their rosters to begin. And so he came in to see me, sat down, and he was like myself, Irish, and he had an Irish brogue. And so we started talking, and he was telling me how difficult it is to send the children to school, and I understood that, and he's working, stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, I said, well, I'm willing to help you. I said, by the way, I said, you know, I said, you're, you're three children now. I said, one's going to be a senior, one's going to be a junior, the other one's a freshman. I said, now, I said, uh, have you asked them to, you know, get a part-time job? Are they working this summer to sort of help them make up for the, you know, the shortfall? And he said, uh, oh, no, Bishop, or Monsignor at the time. He said, oh, no, Monsignor. He said, uh, he said, they're in Ireland. I said, where are they? He said, they're in Ireland. He said, oh, every, every summer they go to Ireland uh, they, because they spend the summer in Ireland. So I think to myself, I'm Irish. And I think when I was growing up, you know, my parents were from Ireland. Uh, we did without a lot of things, you know, just for them to be able to get us through school, you know. And, uh, you know, so in those situations, I just said, well, don't you think, you know, it might have been good to sort of ask your son, daughter to sort of, maybe realize that, the, that we need some help with tuition, that you couldn't do it all, that maybe it'd be good if they helped out a little bit, you know? So he didn't see, didn't see, see the connection between that, you know? So, so these things are difficult. They're difficult situations, you know? So for that student who wrote about the uh, prom situation not being able to go, you know, first of all, I don't want you to be ashamed if you can't go. And don't be afraid to say to your, to your friends, well, mom and dad, we can't afford it. We can b barely afford that. There's no shame in being poor, you know? The shame is to be ashamed of being poor, you know. But the important thing is just to sort of continue to work. And hopefully if people are going to look down on you because you're poor, well, you don't want to, you don't want to be friends with those people anyway, you know. But the other aspect is uh, for the student, I, I do ask to have your parents either go to the administration to talk to them and see how, what can be worked out. And if it's really a tremendous financial stress that has caused this, you know, uh, you know, don't be afraid to have them call me to see what I can do to help out, okay. So anyway, that sort of answers the question, I think, in some ways. Having said that, are there any questions of people here? Church of Silence again. <laughs> any, uh, this is your last opportunity before we break for uh, Easter and for a long time, but uh, no questions. Okay, well, let me ask a question. Uh, we have some students from McDevitt here in the, the room here, so maybe I'll ask them. Uh, let me ask you if you'd like to get up and talk. Has this uh, couple of weeks been beneficial to you? Have you learned anything that you didn't know, or would any of you like to respond to that? If you would, just go to the mic here. And don't all jump at once. <laughs> don't be embarrassed. I'm, uh, I, Or anybody out there, it's also well. Okay, please. What is your name? Lisa. Lisa, Lisa from McDevitt is going to say something. Closer to the mic. What? Closer to the mic. I think this has been very beneficial. Like I was in the computer lab the one time where we were like up there, not mm -hmm. like in person. <laughs> But um, I really like how you're coming to talk to us because, like, we are going through, like, a rough time. Like, our generation has a lot of problems to deal with. So I think I really appreciate the personal, you know, aspect of, like, you coming and actually talking to us about these things. So I really appreciate you. Good. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate it. Thank I you. appreciate it. Good. <laughs> Anything that anybody out there will take away from the uh, past couple of weeks you might want to ask or or any other topic you please what is your name uh, Dominic Dominic okay Dominic again from McDevitt uh, hello Bishop uh, uh. you were talking about how to dance at prom and I wanted, I wanted to know what would, be, what would be the appropriate way to dance that's a good question what's the appropriate way to dance <laughs> being from Philadelphia the mummer strut is right no <laughs> 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 or the line dance is it uh, what uh, 
what, what I'm talking about is sexually suggestive ways of dancing that are not appropriate. You know what I mean? The idea of grinding, the idea of things that, you know, give an imitation of, you know, what is uh, a very personal type of thing. The idea of becoming so close to somebody that, you know, there, there is a commingling uh, of two bodies in such a way that really is only appropriate to somebody that is in a relationship that is very significant. You know, we take these things seriously, you know, and it's important to understand that. We're bodily spirits. We, we communicate our feelings and our emotions through our bodies, you know. And we don't want to be giving people the wrong impression. And this is something we have to learn, you know, and that's it's a great question, Don, because it's something we have to learn. It's not, it's not like, you know, we want to make, we're prudes, we, we want you, you know, we, we don't want you to touch people or something like that. We want to do what's appropriate, you know, and so sometimes this, the, the, the dances that some people can do today are really more than just the idea of enjoying each other's company. It, it gets into something that is conveying something that's much, that what we see is very sacred and, and really that can be very troubling for individuals, you know, because you're in an age right now, and this is the way God has made it, right? There's a heightened awareness of your sexuality, heightened awareness of your desire to share yourself, you know? And God makes us that way because you're young and, you know, and, but the thing is, we've got to control those appetites so that we don't hurt ourselves or hurt others. Uh, and you know that in your friendships, you know? Uh, and that's an important aspect of that. You know, as you go through life, I think I told this before, an advice I got from a priest years ago when I was a senior, when we were leaving high school, he said to me, remember this, as you go through life, you'll make many acquaintances but few friends. I never understood that until you start to go through life. You meet a lot of people on the way, and you may think they're your friends, but actually they're just acquaintances. And so you've got to make sure that if you're going to share yourself with somebody, you know, and express yourself and your inner being with somebody, that it's somebody that you've really thought about it. And this is somebody that you want them to know, right? Uh, unfortunately, our society today, in the society that we're, you're in, that you're growing up in, it's a very sexually charged society, you know, to our detriment. It's very hurtful. You know, it's no, there's no secret that, you know, half of the marriages today fail, 50% fail. You know, why? Because, you know, a lot of times we're, we're taking advantage of things that we shouldn't be, you know, so. So that's what I mean by sexually suggestive, it's sort of like grinding and, yeah, okay. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any questions from those who are in the field there today? Lancaster, DeLone, Lords. We haven't heard from Lords. Does anybody in Lords have anything to say up there? We must, we need to get one question. Don't be, don't be, don't be ba bashful. Church of Silence from Lords. Yeah. Okay, we won't, no, no others, we see no others? Okay. Oh, okay, one more. Okay. Morning, George. Um, I just want to say, uh, nowadays a lot of young people uh, know a lot more than they ought to. Um, and a lot of times adults have a hard time, you know, dealing with this. So do you have any advice to adults on how to um, basically approach this, not necessarily a problem, but well, it's a good question, George. And one of the issues is, yeah, your generation has grown up, obviously, uh, with a lot of information and a lot of knowledge that perhaps uh, young people of your own age didn't have years ago, okay? That's both a blessing and a curse, okay? It's a blessing in a sense, there's an awareness of the world, right? The curse is that sometimes you also see the bad things of the world at a much earlier age also. And unfortunately, sometimes the information that you're given is not processed you know, in a sense of, and so therefore, it's not learned in a particular sequence that helps you to be able to deal with that. So what I would say is, for example, your parents, understand this, your parents are, your, are not your best friends. And I always tell parents, your parents aren't supposed to be your best friend. Your parents have a much deeper relationship with you than friends. You are bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh. So you're more than just, you're more than just a, simply a friend to them, you know. 
your parents are people who love you deeply. You know, and hopefully, you know, they are trying to encourage you and help you to grow into the wonderful men and women that God desires you to be, you know. And so, you know, you have to be, pay attention to them, you know. And also sometimes they're going to ask you things that you think, you know, you're at the point now where you want independence, you know. And in many ways, your parents want that too, but it's hard to let go. <laughs> you know, when, when they held you in their arms when you first came out of the womb, you know, and they nursed you and stuff like that, there's an emotional tie to that that they never want to lose. You know, so it's hard for them to let you go into a world that they know sometimes is a very cold world. It's a very difficult world. And so a lot of times they will try to sort of protect you, you know, from things that they, they would see can be hurtful to you. Uh, and you can understand that. But you also have to be able to be in dialogue with your parents and respectfully to sort of say, you understand, you know, uh, their concern. You understand their care for you, you know, but you, you, you would appreciate them, you know, allowing you to sort of uh, the freedom that you need to grow and develop. And you, you promise them that you always try to be respectful, you know, and always try and pay attention. Um, I'll just tell you one other story. Uh, is that, does that sort of answer, George? Yeah. It's it sort of pay attention. I'll tell you one last story about my parents, I, you know, uh, and I, I like to share my own stories sometimes with my parents. Uh, when I had gone to college, you know, uh, I had lost my mother, you know, and I was a sophomore. My father w was sort of watching the house, et cetera. You know, so one Friday night I went out, you know, and we were having a sort of a party for uh, a friend of mine who was going into the service, you know, and uh, my father used to get up every morning, go to mass, used to go to work at seven o'clock. And so it was like a Wednesday night and it was in the summertime, you know, so we were having this party. Well, next thing I know, it's like two o'clock in the morning, you know, and at this time I'm 20 years old, you know, but we're, so we're having a good time. And all of a sudden the phone rings at this house, right? And next thing I know, they say, it's for me. And so I go, so who's calling me? I go to the phone, it's my father. And he says, where are you? You know, I said, well, I'm at this party. He says, it's time to come home. I wasn't happy about that, and I was also being embarrassed. But then, uh, you know, he said, look, he says, I cannot go to sleep until I know that you're safe. And he said, I have to be up in another three hours. And he said, I think you had enough of that. Now, I could be very mean to say no, but I went home, you know, and I went home because, you know, I realized my father really cared about me, you know, and he was worried that something would happen to me. And uh, unfortunately, you know, within the year he died of cancer, you know, but uh, the one thing that I knew was, you know, he was looking after me, you know, I was independent, you know, I was a big shot, but at least I knew somebody was looking after me. And so sometimes we have to weigh those things, George, you know, and pay attention to your parents, pay attention to the elders, you know, uh, the people who love you, because uh, that will help you out in the long run. Uh, they're not putting hoops in your way, or not putting barrels in your way to make life miserable for you. They love you and uh, respect them. So with that, again, nice to be with you. Thanks. Uh, have a very happy Easter. And, uh, you know, again, uh, congratulations as you move on from uh, high school. And uh, probably I'll see most of you perhaps at your graduation. So I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, God bless.